well, there's uh, there's a plan of the proceedings. I mean, Eric got an invitation and then he extended it to a few of his friends, I suppose. Can I call myself a friend again? And, <laughs> and so um, we were thinking that maybe as init I mean, initiated by this deep dive, um, that we have a special volume on sort of deep generative modeling. I, I would do the, do the yeah, I mean, deep is all relative. Yeah. Um, uh, in growth problems. And as we all know, I mean, you're also doing general models essentially, right? You're generating something. So, um, and I think you said, I mean, we would need. I need six. So, to say the proposal is very simple. I need six tentative papers with uh, potential list of authors. Right. Can the can the I can offer one. Actually, can the editors actually submit papers as well? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, we have to write kind of the uh, we we have an introduction to write. And then we can be uh, part of uh, the first author or last author on uh, no more than I think no more than ten papers, right? No more than no, I think it's <laughs> six papers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have to hold back a little bit. So if you got interested, you can try the end. And uh, so, uh, it was uh, I did that last year with uh, I don't say well, it was uh, I, I sent the paper. It's it's quite it's quite fast. In fact, it was so. Uh, the, because uh, you enter a schedule, and I think the, then it's quite fast. The viewing process is fast, uh, the, the, the acceptance is fast, and then the, the way it proceeds is they send back the stuff. Uh, it's a kind of uh, shell attack stuff. And it's a good journal. It's a good journal. It's a good journal. Yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, let us. Uh, so if you are interested, you just send the mail to me or Anna or Sebastian, and then we will write the proposal. Yeah, just between the two. Oh, it's not proposal. Actually, it's something that is proposal. It's not. It's not that. Okay, okay. Okay, let's stop. But anyway, so yeah, um, let me say that. Let's. I mean, as a growth round, I mean, like by the end of the week, if you have an interest, please let yeah. Eric know. So we get a rough idea if there's any interest or not, right? By the end of this week, if you have an idea, and don't be shy. I mean, no, 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 yeah, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's uh, always a pleasure to to come see old friends, and uh, and. <clears throat> I think next time we should just do it in Edinburgh and we'll get a few non-Edinburgh people to, to come. We'll just bring you first class. It will be cheaper. And... The Okay, so the topic for this uh, this talk is uh, is both uh, in line with the, uh, with the theme of the deep dive and it's kind of like an homage to uh, Alan and, and Eric because it blends the kind of uh, tools and algorithms that they have been pioneering and that uh, I have found uh, very, very useful. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marcelo Pereira. I am uh, an imaging scientist. I'm mainly interested in developing mathematics to solve problems in imaging. And my um, area of specialization is space and inference in, uh, in inverse imaging problems. Uh, space and inference and Imaging sciences have a kind of like a special relationship, a bit like the UK and, and the US. We sort of like, if you look at the literature, the a lot of the you know interesting developments in in simulations started with problems related to imaging and signal processing, and then there's moments where you know they drift a bit apart and then they reconnect, and you know sometimes the imaging people think we're better than the and the computational statisticians because our models are bigger. And sometimes the computational statisticians think that uh, they're better than us because um, they can prove things and we can't. And so sort of like the communities coexist like this. The topic of this uh, specific uh, uh, talk is uh, how to use generative priors to solve inverse problems in, in imaging when the problems are, are quite large. But I will start with problems that are really small because when we go to problems that are large, a lot of the techniques that uh, that uh, we would like to use stop working. And this is something where I really think that 
this is an aspect where I really think that the inverse problems uh, community can can contribute a lot to to the you know the generative modeling literature in general. When I see papers of generative modeling, you know, sometimes they have very interesting mathematical results, but they are full of uh, of nonsense if we can put it in a certain uh, sort of like. I don't mean to insult anyone, but you know. There's this idea that you know we can learn distributions in really large spaces, and uh, and that you know there's no notion that maybe a problem is ill-posed or or ill-conditioned or that it's difficult or that it would be you know very unstable. You know, you just you know take some architecture. Yeah. Can I just use ad hoc statement that there's no people be happy to use that? Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so. The let's say you start looking at uh, at the generative modeling literature in some very high profile conference proceedings. You will, you know, if you're new to the community, you might be misled into thinking that, you know, a lot of these problems are actually much easier than what they really are, and that I can give you a large data set of cats and you can learn the distribution of cats. Because you can, you know, get PyTorch to adjust the parameters of a neural network such that when a Gaussian random virus enters, out comes a cat. You know, it might be that you just learned a good way of generating images of cats that doesn't have the right moments of the distribution of cats, or that doesn't have the right tail, or that doesn't have um, any of the aspects that you would care about if you're doing uncertainty quantification. But this is not particularly clear when you read the literature on generative modeling, particularly if you're looking at state of the art deep generative modeling techniques. And you know, we will present scores and metrics that say that method A is better than method B. This is very empirical and it's often based on very simple crude metrics. What I see when I try to use any of the state of the art techniques inside an inverse problem, and I use it as a prior, then you can you can see when the methods break and it's not very difficult i'll show you examples later but you can see things like if i take a set of celebrity faces and i train again and i generate a face and then i add blur and noise and i restore it it works fine but if i take a real image from the training data set what comes out is always a white male right so why well, because you know the distribution has these problems of mode collapse and you know and, and you know biases and all of that, and you know people have reported this in the literature specifically on you know issues related to to sort of like gender, uh, but you know in the inverse problem you can see it straight away that uh, you know your prior has suffered from strong mo mode collapse and most of the probability mass is on this specific part of the spectrum, and you can start running statistical tests and checking everything that has gone wrong. So I find that generative modeling as just an application in computer vision or applied to light touch image restoration doesn't stress generative models too much. Whereas when you use them to solve an inverse problem, you care about aspects of the distribution that are harder to learn. And I won't have time to go into that today, but you know, at some point soon, I'll put an archive a paper where we have done you know, basic tests about quantiles and things like that for a range of inverse problems where we take simple priors, not as simple as a Gaussian prior, but things that are fairly basic. And then we move through the literature, you know, into the early 2000s with sparsity based models and things like that. And then we progress to score based models and um, generative models. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the more you move in time, the worse the Bayesian models tend to get if you're not really, really careful. So there is, you know, a, a sense of success and progress that I don't particularly share. I think the community is a bit one dimensional when it comes to, um, you know, how these things are used in, in imaging. So going back to my talk, I'll assume that I'm interested in recovering an image X. Yeah. Just about that. Um, but isn't it that their normal test metric actually checks actual like moments conditions and just like they apply feature maps to their test data like to the training data and test data and to the generated sample 
And then in these feature phases, check moments exactly. So exactly what you're describing. Well, what I see for high dimensional data sets is largely insufficient. So if you would take the empirical covariance of like the state of the art models of generated. So yeah, and you and you compute. Different. Yeah, so let's say I compute the you know the sample Wasserstein distance between two data sets, high dimensional data sets. This is already very difficult to do. Yeah, I mean, the estimator for the Wasserstein distance has its own issues. It's not particularly well posed. It has you know biases. And you rarely see even that. Usually you have this uh, fresh uh, distance. Yeah, but this is, I mean, they, they just apply feature maps and then do Wasserstein, like they, okay, they just compare moments, I think, right? Yeah. But, yeah. They compare marginal moments, they compare things that are very basic. So, as a result, you might think you're getting better and better moments, and you're getting better and better moments that are better in a very narrow sense of the term. It doesn't mean they are particularly good. Um, so, Okay, so let's say I want to estimate a, a nano image X. Um, you know, if you don't care particularly about imaging, that's okay. It's just a very high dimensional vector. Um, so in our applications, X is typically of dimension 10,000, but I'll start with images that are very small from the MNIST data set where you can analyze it to death. And then at the end of the talk, I'll show you how it works on real images. Uh, I don't get to measure X, I get to measure Y. And Y doesn't have all the information I need to recover um, X. And this is standard in, across imaging sciences. You never have the information that you need to recover the image. Because invariably, if your instrument could give you a good image at the resolution of, I don't know, 200 by 200 pixels, the imaging scientists would want to use it at 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. And if your MRI scan can get a good MRI scan of a patient in 20 minutes, you know, the hospital would like to use it in two minutes uh, so that they can get 10 patients faster and the patients move less and so forth. So imaging you know, techniques are constantly operating at a point where you don't have enough information to recover image reliably. And that is okay because we have a lot of ways of regularizing these problems to make them well posed. And, uh, as a generative, uh, sorry, as a general model, I'll say that uh, y and x are related by you know, some statistical model with likelihood function, with a likelihood function that we can write down. You know, for now, I'll assume that y is equals to ax star plus noise, but this is not important. What I'll show later works if you change Gaussian for Poisson or binomial, and you know, we have some papers where we explain how to do it, and we should. It's, it's certainly, you know, it's just an easy model to illustrate. And it's fairly general. With this kind of model, you can describe relatively well a wide range of instruments. So this is a standard sort of like general model. And the general theme is X is not well, you know, recovering X from Y is not well posed unless you bring in additional information to regularize the problem and make it well posed. So there's three main mathematical frameworks that imaging scientists like to use to regularizing those problems and make them well posed. You can come from um, you know, functional analysis or applied analysis and, uh, and you know, formulate your problem in that setting. And particular France has a very strong school that, that does that, also Germany. And alternatively, you could formulate it as a, a Bayesian inversion problem by using statistical techniques. The UK has traditionally been very strong in, in that uh, particular school of thought, and also the French computational stats and some other European computational stats communities. And the third flavor is machine learning. If you have you know, some training data, or now you don't even need training data, there's self-supervised techniques, you can you know, train a model to compute an estimate of X from Y. That is something we now know how to do quite well. And if you look at the detail of how these methods operate, you can spot very quickly that they have complementary strengths and weaknesses. If you're doing mathematical analysis, you can typically prove a lot about the nature of your solution and about the algorithm that you're using to compute the solution. Um, you know, until a few years ago, we didn't have good non-asymptotic convergence rates for uh, Bayesian algorithms, and we certainly didn't have any guarantees for machine learning. Whereas the sort of like analysis community has had good convergence results for the algorithms for much longer. They've also had good stability results. How does the solution behave when 
you know, the noise level goes to zero, uh, proofs that the solution is well posed. If you look at Bayesian statistics, the results are, well, first of all, with Bayesian statistics, you can do a lot of things that you cannot do with functional analysis. So Bayesian statistics comes equipped with a beautiful decision theory that allows you to do uncertainty quantification, um, you know, formulate tests, formulate things like model comparison, um, model selection, check model misspecification intrinsically. It can do a lot of things that I will illustrate later and that you cannot do you know, so well with, with analysis. But until a few years ago, and you know, until Eric and Alain spent a lot of time on it, we didn't have good non-asymptotic rates for um, high dimensional Bayesian computation algorithms. So the algorithms were run on the assumption that you know, after a sufficiently long number of iterations, they had converged. And this was a fairy tale. These algorithms never converge. And in high dimensions, they really, really never converge. And you know, if you look at the right statistic, you'll see that they have not converged. There's not even an illusion of stationarity. And still they produce very good results. And now we know why they produce very good results. You know, they contract quite quickly in you know, a sensible way towards the top. And then the third approach, machine learning, has traditionally had much weaker guarantees in all of these senses, and, uh, and you know, very few guarantees that you have even made the problem well posed by you know, training a neural network. But, but they do have this remarkable empirical performance. So they attracted a lot of attention from the community and they can be quite fast as well. So obviously a lot of people have become interested in trying to somehow marry these different strategies. And uh, a lot of work has gone into marrying analysis and Bayesian statistics. And now you have very nice non-convergence guarantees, non-asymptotic convergence guarantees for Bayesian statistics. You have proofs that the Bayesian procedures are well posed in, in the sense of Hadamard. And well, it's a shame Jonas is not here. He has a nice paper on the topic, but uh, well, also Aritha knows quite a bit about that. And um, yeah, so slowly it has been sort of like the, the boundaries have been becoming more, more fuzzy. Um, and this talk is about bringing in machine learning into, into the fold as well. So <clears throat> formally, we're going to assume that X star that we want to estimate is a realization of a random variable that we'll call stochastic X. And we're going to use the distribution of stochastic X to regularize the problem and promote solutions that, uh, that we are expecting. And I, my apologies, I know some of you, you know, know this really well, but I also think a few of you might not know it as well. So I, I, I'll you know, just bear with me if I'm saying something like so. The observation Y is, also model as a realization of a random variable, stochastic Y conditioned on stochastic X haven't taken value X star. And when you want to do inference about X star, you have to use the joint distribution of stochastic X and stochastic Y, which you typically specify through the joint density that you factorize in that way and it highlighted in red. And that has two clear terms, one that is playing the role of a data fidelity term, and one that is playing the role of the, what we call the prior, which is just the marginal distribution of X. And by applying this theorem, you get the posterior distribution of X given Y. And this models your sort of like beliefs about the random variable stochastic X once you have observed that stochastic Y has taken value Y. And uh, for a long time, we've uh, you know, made assumption driven models where we assume certain properties of the solution. We write down a prior based on those assumptions. We get a posterior distribution and we operate in that manner. But in this talk, we're going to assume that our training data, uh, so that we have training data, a set of examples X prime, and that that represents our prior knowledge. So we would like to do Bayesian inference by using this prior knowledge as, as rep, you know, our prime. So this data set is not uh, describing a, a specific distribution. You, know, you can fit infinitely many distributions to that data set but we're going to try to leverage some of the successful strategies from the generative modeling literature in order to find you know, a good way of um, capturing the underlying distribution that has generated this X primes. So the idea is that I don't know X star, but I'll assume that X star is a realization from an ID copy of the of random variables that have generated those X primes. So they'll have the same underlying distribution. They are independent of each other. And I'll try to use that data set to construct a prior. And uh, there's different ways of doing this. And in, you know, I can point you to other papers we've done exploring some other ways. 
but you know, for this talk, I'll uh, I'll really use something called the manifold hypothesis, which in imaging sciences we think is a fairly accurate description of reality, which is that the you know the images that we acquire they take values very close to a low dimensional subset, uh, sorry, manifold of, of the ambient space. And the idea is that, you know, although the image might have a million pixels, in fact, it's taking values very close to a, um, a manifold that is of an intrinsic dimension that is much smaller than a million. And- uh, Do you think people think of this as a vector or, or is it really, they think of smooth? So there's dimensional is it more fractal like a chaotic? No, there's different models. So there's different models, and you know, people aren't quite sure which one is the right model. Luckily, the theory is very robust, and it would work bothly with uh, smooth manifolds and and subspaces. Uh, and but it would also work with uh, with um, you know, more like self similar style. Um, structures and um, the key yeah the key thing is the box counting dimension needs to be low and here i'll assume that the manifold is small but again the some of the recovery guarantees don't require so there's different ways of using the manifold hypothesis i will assume that uh, i can capture this manifold by pushing forward uh Gaussian random variable of low dimension into the ambient space with a suitable push forward function that I'll call uh, new. So new is a, is a neural network. And if you push a uh, Gaussian random variable through this neural network, what comes out is you know, a cat, a celebrity, uh, you know, a satellite image of some agricultural region. It is, you know, whatever you have been, you know, targeting in your application. And, uh, and the idea is that we will, you know, identify the parameters of that neural network from the training data so that when I, you know, push that through this mapping, it is close in distribution in some suitable sense to my training data. And there is, you know, that this is the essence of what model, generative models uh, do. And there's a wide range of strategies that you can do, use to do this. And the first, in the first part of my talk, I, I'll use something called a variational autoencoder, which you know, many of you will, will probably know, but you know, how it works is not particularly important. And the second part of the talk, I'll use a normalizing flow. All I want to say is that historically, you know, GANs have superseded VAEs, and then a few other things have superseded GANs. And we have invariably found that on average, the more modern your technique, the worse it is at learning the prior of the training data set. It gets really good at capturing the first order moment and a few key aspects. So for instance, it will really concentrate on the manifold. So the images that come out look really neat and sharp, but the, maybe the manifold was spanning you know, all of this, and your model has just learned a small fraction, but it has really concentrated on the manifold. So the images look great. Whereas the VAE will not capture the manifold so well. And as a result, you know, the images come out and they're a little bit blurrier and they're a bit less sharp, but maybe it actually captured all of the manifold quite decently. Uh, whereas your GAN was super collapsed on the manifold, but only this part. So when you sample it, you know, it looks fantastic. And you know, when you're computing this, this metrics based on features and looking at moments and marginal moments in particular, you know, it looks okay. Um, but when you're actually you know, drawing examples from the manifold and then looking at the posterior, which needs to concentrate on the manifold, you, you find that it concentrates in a completely wrong place because the prior has suffered from a lot of mode collapse or, or bugs. So, to illustrate this with a picture, this is the Rosenbrock distribution, which looks like a banana. It's in dimension two, and most of the mass is concentrated close to a manifold of dimension one, which is the curve. If you train a variational autoencoder to learn the manifold that supports the banana distribution, it will find what we have here on the right from the samples that are on the left as black dots. So, you know, in this case, we're constraining the manifold to half dimension one, 
it's obviously an approximation. The actual distribution is supported in dimension two, but it's a useful model. And you know, by constraining the dimensionality, you can regularize your inverse problem in a way that is quite effective. So, so you have to know the dimension. No, I'll show you how to estimate it. So, okay. So once you have your latent variable Z and you have your push forward mapping, there's different ways in which you can construct a likelihood function. You can construct a likelihood function that takes into account some modeling errors. But for this talk, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to assume that X is exactly equal to Z projected through the map. So yes, this mapping provides uh, sort of like a one-to-one -one relationship between my latent um, space and the, the manifold that is inside my ambient space. And uh, you know, I can move around the, the manifold by moving on the latent space, which will have dimension, you know, a really low dimension. And then you know you can apply Bayes theorem. Well, I'm, because we know Z is Gaussian, you know, that's its marginal distribution, the prior is Gaussian. And then we can just apply Bayes theorem on the latent variable Z, and we get a posterior distribution that is supported on this uh, submanifold of the ambient space. It does not admit a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure of the ambient space, but that's absolutely fine. We can have a Lebesgue density on the latent space, and on the, the ambient space, we'll just manipulate Monte Carlo samples. So we'll generate samples in the latent space, we'll push them through the push forward measure, and what comes out are samples of the conditional distribution of Z given Y. And, uh, and with that, we can do Monte Carlo inference in the way we would do if we had a density on the ambient space. So there's three main questions that, uh, that we thought are interesting about this kind of approach. The first one is under what conditions would the Bayesian model be well posed in the sense of Hadamard? You know, you've, we've done all of this because the problem is still posed. We want to regularize it. Well, can you actually show that you know the resulting distribution is well posed with uh, sort of like the previous generation of models? more like sparsity style where everything was convex or lock concave and your prior had things like an L1 norm or you know some kind of norm on a dictionary because you had convexity of the potential you know it was not difficult to show that it, it, things behaved well if i move the data a little bit the posterior probability moves a little moments exist um, and everything is stable but once you throw in the neural network and you lose convexity and all of that it's not clear that you know, you still have well postness. So this was one of the things we wanted to check and, you know, do the moments that we care about exist and do they inherit the well postness? Um, the second uh, interesting point was, well, will the Bayesian methods and algorithms that, uh, that we are using deliver, you know, probabilities that are meaningful in some non-subjective way? Obviously, if I have, you know, specified an assumption driven prior, I know what assumptions I'm making, and the Bayesian model is producing probabilities that are not necessarily going to map meaningfully to the real world, but you know they are true with respect to my sets of beliefs and the assumptions I made. It's very subjective probability. But this you know, is not some expert specifying the prime. There's a data set, there's a neural network, Adam fitted the parameters of the neural network. So I think it would be nice if you know, this Bayesian model had some kind of guarantees or, or was more robust to frequentist validation. And it's not just, you know, representing the beliefs of the neural network, which you know doesn't mean anything. And then the third point is, well, would this, um, you know, can we prove convergence for these algorithms? And, you know, point number three, I'm not going to discuss it today because it's, it's not so interesting. You know, we're going to use a Langevin sampler subject to, you know, reasonable smoothness conditions and growth at, of the potential at the tails. Yes, you know, you can have non-asymptotic rates, the constants are a bit mysterious because of the non-convexity, but you know, like well, um, questions one and two are a bit more open. So uh, I will not present any technical details, but you know, there's a paper published and a paper in preparation that uh, we can we can share a draft with you uh, if you're interested. So okay, so to make sense of the probabilities reported by this model we're going to ask, operate in what's called as an M-complete framework. So the idea is that there exists a true Bayesian model. Um, 
if you're not too Bayesian, you will not find this controversial. But within the Bayesian community, people get really excited about you know <laughs> what modeling framework they're using and uh, and about whether there is a true prior or not. In our case, it's not controversial. The training data set is assumed to come from you know a marginal distribution that we assume to exist. And as a result, you know that's nature's prior for generating you know images of cats, dogs, or you know chest CT scans of you know someone's lungs, and that's you know nature's true model. And obviously, it would be ideal if we had nature's model because then you know our inferences would also be um, you know ex exact in the sense of frequentist probability. You know, if you're using nature's model, then Bayesian inference is just a very straightforward. You know, high school application of probability theory. There's nothing you know, interesting about that or unexpected. But of, obviously, we don't know it, nature's model, and uh, you know our Bayesian models are not naturally going to be robust to frequentist validation. And you know, uh, so we are going to work with that model, P star as nature's model, and any other model that we write down or learn is is a, an approximation of P star, and it, it's good or bad in as much it can approximate some important aspect of P star, which is relevant to the application. Uh, so P star is how we'll call the true posterior distribution that nature would use. Um, so as I said, we regard the samples as you know, realizations of nature's true prior. And, uh, and when we are you know, learning the, you know, the, the, the manifold, what we're trying to do is approximate nature's prior. And if we can approximate it well, and our likelihood is well specified, then we get Bayesian probabilities that are quite useful for real world applications. And if we don't, then they're less useful. And we are going to um, do some experimental validation of this. This is not something you can um, analyze theoretically in a meaningful way. You need to bring some you know, external validation data set and run statistical tests to see if your model is behaving well or not. So, um, under some conditions, which are pretty much identical to the conditions of the original Andrew Stewart paper on, on you know, the well poisonous of Bayesian models, we can show that yeah, these models, you know, produce these models are well poisonous in the sense of Hadamard in the latent space, in the ambient space as well. Moments exist, and you know, there's nothing to, to worry about. But it, it's good to check it. Okay, so let's move on to some some pictures before everyone falls asleep. So, okay, first thing, latent dimension. So there's different estimators of the latent dimension of the manifold. You know, there's uh, a few that have actually been published several times under different names without citing each other. So you, know, you have really a, a wide range of, of options if you want to estimate dimension. The one that we prefer is this one. Um, so what you do is, you progressively increase the latent dimension. So you it's a bit onerous, you have to retrain, but it's really easy to understand what it's doing. So you, you train the model under the assumption dimension is two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 20. In this case, this is done for MNIST. And then you calculate the trace of the covariance of your training data set when it's projected on the manifold. And you use that trace of the covariance as a surrogate for the amount of information that you know you're encoding, and it's it's fairly direct because the assumption is that once you encode the samples, they become a standard Gaussian random variable. So the trace of the covariance is really directly related to, to the amount of information that the random variable has, and you increase this, and you see that for MNIST, when you get to dimension twelve, then the amount of information sort of like saturates. And although you give the model more dimensions, you know, it's as if the posterior covariance doesn't really capture more information. All you're doing is adding, adding you know, extra dimensions. But if you did a PCA, you would find it low rank. So that's what we use. There are other estimators based on, on you know, the score function or on the noisers um, that you can use to estimate the latent dimension. An easy way is you add, you take your data set, you add Gaussian noise, and you know that a certain proportion of the Gaussian noise will fall outside of the manifold because the manifold has low dimensions. So a certain fraction of the noise, you know, doesn't see it and goes through. And then you can measure the loss of information in your data set 
by using an estimator that tells you how well you can recover the non-noisy samples from the noisy samples. And the rate at, what that, uh, at which that deteriorates depends on the dimension of the problem. And if you do it, you'll see that for MNIST, you get 12. Okay, so there's different ways. There's also an estimator based on nearest neighbors and assuming that there's some kind of Pareto distribution between you know, points when they're on a manifold. Sorry. So this is um, after you run the N folder on your test image. In the Latin space with the trace of the covariance. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so once we've done that, for them, I mean, I mean, I can see a linear manifold, but in perf manifolds, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So if to get it to work really well, and to the theory, you need to assume that the noise level tends to zero. If you want to do it based on the noise that you're projecting, you, you do it with a very low small, with a very low level of noise. Um, I don't know if that estimator, for instance, would work if you assume you have a fractal you know, situation. But in uh, in terms of you know estimating the the dimension of data sets like ImageNet and you know MRI scans, it works quite well. Is it clear? Like if you do this for a manifold that you actually know, is it seen as a time? Uh, you, 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 no, time? you hit it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we did the test, like we just trained a GAN. And yeah, you can you, you recover it quite well. Okay, so when would you like to use this kind of uh, prior? Well, you want to use this kind of prior when you have an inverse problem that is really ill posed. Otherwise, you know, there's other things out there that you know will be competitive. So with MNIST, we can analyze you know, the data set in lots of different ways. So we did different problems and different tests. So this is denoising, which is a, a problem that is interesting because it's, um, it's not that you know, ill-posed or anything. The condition number of the forward operator is one. So the problem is not you know, unstable. But, and what we see here is a neural network like a DNCNN trained end to end. Uh, trained on MNIST to recover the original image from the noisy measurement. This is if you compute the map estimator for our model, and this is if you compute the posterior mean. And uh, and uh, well, you know, the moral of the story is that when there's not a lot of noise, everything does more or less okay. And in fact, you know, some things like the neural network will do better than us because they will you know, capture fine details that we did not capture because we are constraining the problem too much by going to dimension 12 and by using a generative model. Generative models, um, well, now with score-based models, maybe it's going to be a bit different, but in general, they're not as good as cap at capturing like very subtle details as a convolutional neural network would be, that you just train end-to-end -end for that specific task. However, when you crank up the noise, so for instance, in this case, the noise is ridiculously high, you can still recover, you know, quite accurately the original digits because uh, in dimension 12, your posterior distribution is super concentrated. The prior has been learned properly. It concentrates in the right place. Uh, the same situation within painting. So here you only see a subset of the pixels. This arise just all the time. So if you take, you know, an MRI scan or a CT scan, there is a form of, of in painting that's happening. It's a bit more subtle than this, but it's in painting. If you're taking an image at a very long distance, typically you're shooting a laser to acquire each pixel. So you only take a few pixels, otherwise whatever you're imaging moves and you know, goes away while you're acquiring them. And, and again, you, know, you can see just from a very small number of pixels contaminated with noise, you can recover the original digits quite accurately. And the same thing with uh, deep blurring. And yeah, so the moral of the story is, you know, in low dimensions, the model is behaving quite well. Now, what can you do with these models that you would not be able to do with competing models? And I've not seen this done with, uh, with any other model so far. So we've trained a really specific prior that has been trained to model very well the distribution of MNIST. But you know, it's not so easy to tell that you know, whatever is hiding there is really a digit. It could be that you, you have training data, 
and you used it to train your model, and then you deploy this in nature, and what you know nature shows you is not, and then they stitch it, and you reconstruct it with your model. And if you train your model based on you know, thousands or you know modern models will be trained with millions of examples, what will come out will be a beautiful MS digit. And it's the same, you know, you can train a model with a, you know, to generate CT scans. And if I put a cat, you know, you will get a CT scan of, of sort of like a 40-year-old name. <laughs> because the model has, yeah. Yeah, how, how many samples did you use to learn your plan? In this case. Yeah. Uh, fifty thousand. Yeah, it's a pretty huge. Yeah, yeah, and it's just a question of um, in in um, practical circumstances, uh, how how many samples do you actually have for your so, client? Yeah, it depends a lot. Uh, so in some problems, I think you might have a thousand samples. So now we're moving. It's not part of this talk, but we're doing a lot of work on uh, on using techniques related to equivariance to learn directly from the measurement y. So there's there are some very neat tricks that um, if you know your prior has certain symmetries. So for instance, I know the probability that X is in this orientation should be the same as X in this orientation because you know like, well in the case of MNIST, it's not the same. Like a number seven is not a number seven if you flip it upside down. But for a lot of natural images, that's true. You can uh, if you do all of that, then it turns out that you can recover the margin of X from margin of Y. But you know, in that case, you have less data. But for these problems, there's a lot of work where you just, you know, I don't know, satellite images of uh, of uh, you know urban regions or agricultural regions. You know, Europe is is live streaming satellite images all the time. They have a constellation of satellites that produce free data, so you know you can really have as much as you want. So, Sorry. could you again say how so methods then you would take from the variation alpha encoder? The zero and see what comes out or what? No, map is the maximum of posterior estimation. Yeah, and so you do the plunger thing or you because no, 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 no. You you use uh, uh, optimization algorithm uh, with flavor of ADMM. So you get some number log that you infer from the general model and then you do optimization. Yes, it's you, you end up you know writing in, for this in practice you end up writing a joint density of x and z and you maximize jointly with respect to the two. It works a little bit better than just maximizing with respect to Z. And sorry, how does your algorithm work? Oh, here we're just using ULA. Ah, so this, so your algorithm is. This like is ULA. This is convex optimization. I mean, convex. It's a non convex problem, but it's a convex optimization algorithm that is initialized carefully. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah thanks. So if you're using any kind of generative prior and you're in an application where you care about, the, you know the outcome because the idea is that your image is going to inform some meaningful decision or conclusion. Then ideally you should do this: ask your model whether you have, you know, it believes that it can analyze the data that you're feeding into the model. So rather than just feeding it into a neural network and getting something that comes out, which in our case is, you know, the network will hallucinate something that looks exactly like what you're expecting. What you can do is use statistics to so just run a statistical test. You know, is this data point you know, from my distribution or not? Am I in an out of distribution or distribution shift situation? Well, what test, test should you use? It's easy. We've known for 100 years that the Neiman Pearson test is the most powerful test for this kind of problem. Uh, it involves calculating likelihoods. In our case, the likelihood is a marginal likelihood. It's a bit harder to calculate from an MCMC algorithm. You have algorithm. I mean, you have estimators of the marginal likelihood. So we, uh, you know, run this test on our training our testing uh, set or on our training set, sorry. We get a null distribution for the marginal likelihood. And then when we have a testing point, we test whether we think it is a sample from the distribution or not. You can calculate a p-value. And if your p-value doesn't look right, then you reject that data point and you say, my neural network should not be analyzing this point because it looks like there has been some kind of distribution shift or something fishy. When you use the map, you use the map all the data. Yeah. So when when I compute the maximum of posterior yeah. estimator, okay. So the, there is a paper by Andres Almanza that sort of like analyzes really carefully different ways of doing it. And what they find works best okay. is to work simultaneously with a variable in the ambient space and a dual variable on the manifold. 
and constrain them to be quite close to each other. Okay. And but you optimize on both, okay. subject so to the constraint. Yeah, they do that because they got some noise on the output and then they speak noise. Wait, some less? Okay. Yeah, Andres Amas, I can send you a paper. And and with that specific scheme, you can prove local convergence. So if you initialize it well, it behaves as you would expect. So, okay, so we then take a data set called not MNIST of doodles that look just like MNIST, but they're not digits. And we show them, but you know, I mean, we, we show the network things like this, and we ask it, is that a digit or not? And then, I mean, we show the network, we show the Bayesian model that relies on a network to describe its prior. And we run the Neiman Pearson test. And we do it for denoising in painting and deep learning in the situation where there's quite a lot of noise. And so for denoising and deep learning, where you observe all the pixels, so your problem is not uh, ill post, it's just ill condition. Then with a power of 99 point a lot, you can spot a fake digit. And, and this is you know, quite important because we have moved into a territory where the prior is you know, very, very informative, a lot more informative than likelihood. So if you fit the likelihood something that is not you know, what you should be analyzing, your basic model is still going to produce something that looks you know, very realistic. And so you know, this test protects you from it. And in in-painting, you only have a few pixels, so it's harder, but you still have a power of roughly 90%. And then the last test we did, I mean, in the paper, we have a few others, but the last test I want to show you is the empirical coverage of this Bayesian probabilities. So we asked the model to calculate a high posterior density region. So that's essentially asking the model, rather than to say, which is give me the image, you say, you know, find a part of the space that you think accumulates 90% probability of containing the truth. Okay. And then we run this lots of times because we have our testing. Data set. So we say, okay, we generate Y from the first image of the testing data set. We ask the model, you know, give us with 90% probability where you think the true image is. The model goes here. And then we check, is it there or not? Okay. And that's a Monte Carlo estimator of, you know, how good your pro Bayesian probability is from a frequentist evaluation point of view. And we do that for different probabilities. We ask the model to find a set of probability 10%, 11%, until 99%. And this is what we get. Now, this might look, it's a bit far, but this is really spectacularly good compared to what you would get with most uh, imaging models. I mean, if you do this with uh, the I know, Gaiman and Gaiman Gibbs sampler, you know, the, the lines are so far apart, you cannot put them in the same plot. Um, so, you know, this is the first example in the imaging literature of a Bayesian model for MNIST, which is simple, but it's still, you know, a Bayesian model for an imaging problem where you get Bayesian probabilities that, you know, you can defend to a frequentist audience and that, you know, makes sense if you're, you know, analyzing your procedure in a setting where you're going to be repeating the procedure several times and you're going to be replicating an experiment and you want some form of guarantee that the probability that you're producing is, you know, is something you can defend in that setting, as opposed to a probability that is valid in a subjective sense that here would be a bit so uncomfortable. So it's the coverage for the for the Bayesian credible region. So what would be the Bayesian confidence intervals for the solution? For? No. No, no, it's it's from the marginal distribution. There is no classification here. Yeah. So Okay, if so the construct is called the phase variance normal. If you count, whether it's called the phase variance normal, it has a right phase variance. So it's a phase variance. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so we were quite excited about this because the whole point about whether you know Bayesian imaging was a suitable Bayesian inference was a suitable framework to solve imaging problems is something that you know comes back to the time of Julian Bessac. And you know, if you ask Peter Green, he will tell you that. You know, at the beginning, they were really excited about these models in the 80s, and then they realized the Bayesian probabilities that came out of the models were rubbish, and then they kind of like lost interest. So in the 90s, you know, it kind of faded away, and then the statisticians got a bit excited about imaging again with sparsity, and you had like Donahoe and some, you know, you know, very you know, cool people working on this, and then again, they lost interest, and, and well, we're hopeful that this is sort of like now 
the, the final stage of the saga and that we'll start having Bayesian models that you know can do probability. So the key is that you project it down on these low dimensional learning holes. Is that sort of the key? No, the key is that is really the data driven prior. This uh, these priors are close enough to the actual distribution that generates the the, the unknown image. Um, so we so even if you were to misspecify the dimension, like you go up to fifteen, but that's really twelve. Yeah, it would still work. I think it would still do probably okay. Yes. So we have, so we have, my laptop is running out. We have, um, now we have a paper coming out where we've done this. It's okay, I have a, a judge here. So we have repeated this experiment with um, lots of different models. And, and we are having good results even for some score-based models that do not explicitly assume a dimensionality. Um, with score-based models, what we find is that it's really important to estimate some of the parameters of the model by maximum marginal likelihood estimation. If you, we can discuss it later, but uh, you know, the score-based models have a certain noise level, but the idea is that, you know, you eventually get to a point where this noise level goes to zero. That's a really bad idea because when the noise, you know, having a bit of noise smooths your scores. It's like a basic way of regularizing the scores. The idea that your data can allow you to estimate the scores with an infinitely low noise is, is sort of like a fairy tale. So, I know exactly about that also because, because you said these models don't cover everything because the Bayesian stuff doesn't work. But actually, even if you would have a model that perfectly covers all the manifolds, but if the manifold has disconnected subsets, even if it perfectly sub covers all of the subsets, of course, Euler won't work, right? It depends also these optimization algorithms. Yeah. So it's clear that your algorithms need the noise. It's like it's just if you want to run Euler, you need actually some kind of bad estimation of your manifold. Okay, so I think we can decompose that into different things. So one is about whether your machine learning technique can learn what you're trying to learn. And another one is about whether your Bayesian computation algorithm can handle the model that nature is throwing at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have other Monte Carlo algorithms that are more sophisticated than ULA, and we can handle multimodality and disconnected sets. Um, the problem, in my opinion, is completely in the machine learning corner. The machine learning algorithms, in my experience, have systematically under delivered with respect to what's published. And I think this is a cultural difference, you know, like. Usually when you know when you get a computational stats paper, you know, of course people will you know feel proud of their algorithm, but it's unlikely they will dramatically oversell their algorithm in a way that is as you know aggressive as what you get in the machine learning literature. And you can still come up with a with a Monte Carlo algorithm that is, you know, you know, I've seen you know papers recently, non-asymptotic convergence properties of random walk metropolis hastings. And you know, like people are like, oh, that's an interesting result. We didn't know that one. So it's like, okay, tick. You know, try to you know, do that in, in you know machine learning conference. You, you know, you'll get rejected 12 times. So, you know, but that encourages a certain, you know, form of like presenting a very narrow vision. So I mean, I think that, that you know the machine learning literature is presenting some spectacular methods, but they're it's also biased in, in a weird way. Um, the methods are not nearly, and I think that this is damaging the scientific progress because rather than focusing on the key questions, we end up sort of like trying to do improvements that are a bit artificial. I, am, I agree on all of that. I just think all that you're saying here for score models, you actually need to take a bigger, larger time scale. It again just shows, I think, I mean, if you're well, running Euler, you really you want a noisy version of your. Of your thing, I completely, yeah, I completely agree. We have, yeah. I completely agree. We, and if you want, I, we can take it offline and I can show you papers where we analyze the impact of, you know, we, Tsadoya, we actually, Alan and, and a friend did all of the work, but the, there's a quite a careful analysis of the need of the score. But with the diffusion models, you, you don't necessarily need to stop before you get close to zero, right? In principle, the, the map goes all the way close to zero, and the closer you get to zero, the closer you get to the distribution modulus and problems. But we really find that, you know, stopping it early and deciding when to stop by marginal likelihood estimation is, is essential. Otherwise the models 
you know, underestimate uncertainty uh, really badly. Sorry. Oh, well, it's maybe a little more than the family difference. So, yeah, I can learn one between my and live mainly in that world and start looking at some of the various memory techniques and think of the architecture that has built on the hierarchy model structure that seems to be contribution potentially, but then was presenting here and asked all these questions about it. I know that they um I'm gonna end up with a you know, just minimizing the two by two distance potentially uh very that's a great eighty percent that metrics and all that. Um, so I'm trying to go back to Sebastian's question here. Which is kind of what is, is I'm trying to understand what the review is unique. Like, is it, I mean, if, if I were to, is it the way you're calibrating this neural net? This, this no. Yeah, you, so you no, no, no. Standard stochastic gradient descent. So yeah, the neural network is calibrated in a very standard way. Um, you, the, you minimize it so that you like to it. Yeah. So then, what, what makes it so that? Um, you know, a solution nickel and say, but you've got this collapse in the way the first moment is in which you Well, this is this is uh how are you getting these models that expand out? Well, so we have chosen specifically a VAE because it is a lot more robust to that kind of problem than say a GAN. And this is MNIST. Yes, and this is and the, and the training strategy, and this is a low dimensional data set. Um if I don't have time, so I'll explain this in, in just two minutes. But if you go to higher dimensional models, like say an actual image of, I'll show you an image of a penguin in a few minutes. Uh, and, uh, and there what you find is really the machine learning techniques completely fail. So you can download, we've probably downloaded like 50 pre-trained models. The one that was beating the previous one and the new one and the newer one. And we tried to use it as priors and it systematically failed. The posterior concentrates in the wrong part of the space. There is a lot of mode collapse. You can minimize the pullback leverage divergence. You can try to minimize a Bashir-Stein loss. You can try to minimize an F divergence. You can try different things. These are all normalizing the problem. No, I mean this. Is that the key idea that you got you got distribution, this low dimensional normal distribution is being propagated through those projecting that space, the manifold having a certain. So I'm trying to understand what is it that. Well, these I, ones that are collapsing on and, and failing. What is it they doing? This? I mean, so they're they're all yeah, they're all. I mean, they're all different ways of trying to construct a similar mapping. So you can use uh, either a, a GAN architecture where you have you know this this sort of like saddle point problem where you have two networks competing with each other, a discriminator, a generator. You can try to just to minimize a pullback layer divergence. There are some refinements of that of the variation allowed to colors. There's you know the normalizing flows, and we've you know what we've tried in high dimensions systematically fails with the exception of of this so we've realized that to get this to work we need to make the learning problem easier so we cannot expect that you know a neural network will learn a high dimensional distribution it can sort of like learn to create realistic images that are useful for computer vision in terms of actually learning distribution that's too hard however if you condition on you know, something that is quite informative, then the network only needs to learn a conditional distribution. And that's that's easier, that's more manageable. So what we did was we said, well, we need to condition on something that has low posterior uncertainty. So we went with a low time, low resolution version of the image. So, you know, if, if you're in, in your imaging problem, if you make the image small enough, at some point you have enough data to estimate it really well. And in statistical parlance, that means that this marginal likelihood between Y and a low resolution version U that likelihood gets really concentrated. Of course, you don't know uh, necessarily that likelihood very well because it requires marginalizing over the high resolution image that you would like to know. But if you can do that marginalization, then that one concentrates a lot. And if you take the MLE, so the maximum of that, uh, you have a lot of stats theory that says that you know it will be really close to the truth. So that's what we were going to do. And we're going to construct a, a prior now that uh, is still on the latent manifold. But when I send a code and it needs to be decoded, the neural network sees the code and it also sees a low resolution version of the image in trying to reconstruct. So it says, well, the sort of like space of what I need to learn is smaller and I just need to generate from this condition. And you train uh, a normalizing flow to do this. It's a normalizing flow that's trained to do super resolution. So you give it a low image and it generates examples of high resolution images that could agree with that. 
following the conditional distribution of high resolution given low resolution. So you actually try to take an image and classify it using both the high resolution and the low resolution. Exactly. You, you feed that to the network. And what about the painters and then look at subset distributions for the higher resolution? Exactly. And also it avoids multimodality problems because the, those conditionals are often almost unimodal. When you have this, this property of like being able to identify your bags, I think it's really important. Um, I think I gave a TED talk on this, you know, like why are self-driving cars never going to happen? And my argument was we're never going to be able to solve the experimental design problem. But I think we'll figure out all the images we have to put into the the training system. Mm -hmm. There's no, we just don't know when these Teslas are seeing an environment they never really seen before. If they yeah. have an image coming in, they don't know if it's the mm -hmm. So they, they don't know if it's garbage or not with regards to your model. And so then they, they act with great confidence. And then the Tesla system is driving the truck is like that because their view of the world is very different than the real world is, but they've not seen that image before. And so to have a, a scheme where you can say this data is worth including, this data I haven't seen before, it's the outside of the training set or the distribution of training set is extremely important. Um, tool to have mm -hmm. practically. Maybe this can be generalized to large scale problems. At the moment, it takes a few hours to process an image. So I think we're still. Yeah, we're still yeah. So, yeah, so the basic model looks just as before. It's just that it now also conditions on a low resolution image. I mean, you say you made it sound like it's easy, right? You have a high no. resolution, then you assign a low resolution. But I mean, yeah. it might be different low resolution unless you have your low resolution well designed. I mean, uh, no, it's actually quite. It's not that difficult. So there's, you you define you know how you. Is it just that you say okay, the low resolution is averaging over? You know, yeah, it's a simple procedure. And sort of. Yeah, you you sort of like filter and done sample. Um, and okay. but the key thing is that that likelihood Y given U will now concentrate a lot. Central limit theory kicks in. There's a lot more points in Y than in U, and and now you you know you can know that you have or you have really well. The problem is that it's a it's a sort of like the, the likelihood is not something you can write down analytically. It has an integral. You have to marginalize. But and with that you know I'll show the last algorithm and then just that I result. So we use this stochastic approximation proximal gradient algorithm that is, you know, one of my favorite algorithms at the moment. So you you want to simultaneously sample from the posterior, conditioning on the fact that you have maximized the likelihood of the low resolution image, but you don't know the maximum likelihood low resolution image. So you have to estimate it as well. And and that max optimization problem to get the low resolution image requires marginalizing a likelihood. And you don't know how to do that, but if you have a sample from, in this case, Z, you can, you know, do a, a sort of like stochastic gradient step to improve the likelihood, on average, of U. And at the same time, when you have U, that allows you to draw a new sample of Z. And it sounds like a chicken and egg situation because you would need U hat to draw Z, and you would need a Z to compute U hat. But it turns out that you know this thing converges jointly and slowly U stabilizes around U hat and that stabilizes on the conditional distribution of Z given Y and U hat. And there are some conditions that, you know, are very well understood now. So all this to say that, you know, there's an algorithm you can use and it's a simple modification of ULA. All it does is it calibrates under the hood unknown parameters by maximum margin likelihood estimation, which we have found is by far the most effective way to calibrate this kind of parameters. It gives you a Bayesian model that is in the right place. So these are some final results on this penguin image. So that's the high resolution image. It has a lot of fine detail. You observe a very blurred image because your telescope doesn't have the resolution that you used to have. Uh, and then there's noise. This is if you use uh, uh, sort of like a score based model that you put inside ULA and you draw samples and you take the average. The results of this could actually be better, but we have constrain the estimation of the score so that it is a Lipschitz function with a certain Lipschitz constant that allows us to take large steps. And as a result, we have taken a hit in the quality of the images. But we could improve this a little bit. It would make the computation slower. Um, that's uh, the same score put inside a forward backward scheme, which is some other way of solving the problem. 
This is with a state of the art diffusion model from three weeks ago that uses uh, a specific way of bringing in the likelihood. So, as you know, maybe Alan mentioned, but otherwise you'll see on Thursday, doing inverse problems with diffusion models is not that straightforward. It involves dealing with a likelihood that is a bit complicated and there's different approximations. This is the one that is currently beating the other ones. They're all approximations. And with our model, we get a result that is uh, that is in terms of mean square, almost a DD that. Um, but in all fairness, this is quite fast. But if you want to improve that result, you need to, or do uncertain modification, you need to repeat that diffusion model a large number of times. And if you do that, then it gets just as slow as our method. It will take. Right. No, it's a it's a normalizing flow. Yeah, and uh, we also apply this to a problem called pine sharpening, which is quite nice. So you have so say you're flying a, a pilot drone or pretty much any drone to do multispectral imaging. So you're interested in acquiring an image that has lots of different spectral components. So I don't know, in this case, it's just RGB, but in practice, you would have some infrared information and some ultraviolet and the kind of information you need to spot if vegetation is stressed or you know dehydrated or something like that. And as a result, because you want to measure all these colors in your you know, sensor, you cannot afford to have as many pixels as you would like, because rather than having you know a pixel with lots of spectral components, what you need to have is make it red, green, blue, green, and then as a result, you have less pixels. And your pixels get bigger, but it's not very expensive to put at the same time a very high resolution, you know, image that has no spectral information. It's just like gray levels, and they're both on the drone, and it comes in the same sensor. So if you buy a part of drone, it has both, and it gives you two images: one that looks like this, that has some spectral information, but huge pixels, and another one that has no spectral information, so no color, but high resolution. And then pan sharpening is just the problem of putting both together into a single high resolution color image. And um, yeah, so anyway, we tried on that and it works. Seems to be work fine and sufficiently better than the state of the art, but um, we can use it. Now, with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, we haven't really, we, we took that one because it allows us to quickly test different architectures. There's a lot of work on you know, how to do super resolution. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially, rather than trying to go, learn the composition of possible images, mm -hmm. you just try to learn what are the textures and fine details that you, you sort of like put on top of the composition that the low resolution image is giving you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a joint model. I mean, this normalizing flow is. It's joint yeah, and, it, and it's huge. It has millions of parameters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah we'll send it there. Salah should be finishing it today. Yeah. Yeah. So with multiple? Oh. Um, no, our 
No, our, our manifold is encoded in the neural network, and then we don't. I mean, it's encoded in the way that the low dimensional quantity is mapped in the ambient space. We we don't. Other than that, we don't know much about it. Yeah, it's great. It's so funny. Right? It was not wrong for so. Uh, I don't know many African people that like, like follow it. Yeah, it's like for a uh, pretty much for a long time. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm, uh, there's lots of examples of, you know, a, a network learning, a mapping that looks, you know, close to toroidal. I'm sure that you could cook up some case that will break the network. Have you considered this um, the estimate that you have for the latent dimension on different classes? Uh, because, but for deep, for for certain kind of data sets, I think different classes can have different lines, like different dimensions, and they may even be on different lines. So, so no, in this case, I mean, yeah, we did some tests. What happened? It worked only with the number eight. So the the manifold had lower dimension. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we haven't spent too much time on that. The the way we operate is we take some problem that looks challenging enough to develop to, to motivate the, the developing the methodology but then when it comes to looking at specific applications we we choose some flagship application that we care about and then we focus on that one so with MNIST we wouldn't do any additional I think you know MNIST was good to do this but otherwise I mean um, yeah I guess I need to say I guess it's all the same no, I mean, definitely, definitely. And then I think there's a lot of, you know, room for engineering to, to kick in and work out what's the best way of implementing and make it faster. Yeah, what approximations you can get away with. Yeah, this is... Thank you.